الله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الإسباح ديان الدين رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين آمنوا أشد حبا لله آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف Enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Respected elders, sisters, and brothers, salamun alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. One of the most beautiful feelings that the human being goes through in their life is when they're told that an individual whom they personally love, admire, revere, look up to, loves them as well. If you and I have a relationship with an individual such as our parents, or for example, a scholar, or somebody that we have grown to respect all our lives, we receive a message from them or an indication that they also love us, that they reciprocate the love that we display and exhibit to them, that usually brings about a sensational, powerful, beautiful realization within ourselves. It brings a memorable experience of joy and happiness that a person that we revere and respect so much has also demonstrated love for us. How do we know the specific group of people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the most. Rabbul Alameen, Arhamul Rahimeen, loves all of his creation, there is no doubt. Each and every particle of his creation, he has bestowed mercy and favors and blessings. But like everything else, there are, for example, days of the year that are specifically belonging to him, and are special in his eyes. There are certain places on this earth, that is his creation, that are beloved to him. Likewise, there are human beings whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves more than others. You ask me, who are these? The natural response would be awliyaullah, the friends of Allah, the prophets and the ma'sumin, whom Rabbul Alameen has demonstrated and has spoken about in the Holy Quran about their brilliance and their dedication. Yet it doesn't stop there. Allah wa ta'ala by his abundant magnanimity and beautiful generosity has said that this circle is extended to eight more groups of people. You and I must know these eight. The Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah loves specifically these eight groups of people. And if an individual strives in their lives to become one of those eight, they become of those who attain specifically the love of Allah. When you and I say somebody loves me, it's an emotional state in the heart. But this does not apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not about an emotional state of the heart from Him. It's about the demonstration of how that love means to you and I, whereby it becomes a source of spectacular mercy, rahmah and blessings. We begin to see much more than other people, as far as blessings are concerned. 
You ask me, who are these eight that Allah has specified in the Quran that he loves specifically more than others? Where the Quran says, Wallahu yuhibbu, Allah loves whom? In five different places in the Quran, more than any other group, the number one group, Allah says, I love is whom? Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who do good and serve others in his name. Number one, five times in the Quran, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. Ihsan, hal jazaul ihsan illa al ihsan. When a human being demonstrates virtue, does good, Allah wa ta'ala says, I love this. Yes? And the best of my creation, I have given them the name because of this quality and this exalted attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. Yes? As the narration says, yes? That whom? وَسَمَّاهُ حَسَنًا وَهُوَ الْمُحْسِنْ وَسَمَّاهُ حُسَيْنًا وَهُوَ قَدِيمُ الْإِحْسَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these names, Hassan and Hussein, have been named because of the qualities of Ihsan that I love. I love to see human beings serve others and do good. Do good to themselves by worshipping me and obeying me. Do good to others by making their lives better or assisting them in any shape or form. That's the first category. The second category is whom? Those who are just. In Allah yuhibbul muqsitin. In Surah Al Hujurat, verse number nine, Allah says, "If you practice qist, qist means adala. If you are just in your life, in other words, you try to stay away from injustice, from oppression, from wrongdoing by taking the rights of others. You become automatically into the category of those whom the Almighty loves more than other human beings. Similarly, in Surah Tawbah, verse 108, Allah says, do you want to be of the third category that I love specifically? Yes. Who are they? Inna Allah yuhibbul muttahireen. Allah loves those who seek purity. First of all, physical purity through wudu, through ghusl, through tayammum, through means to stay away from physical impurity. Secondly, by seeking the purity of the heart. By analyzing oneself, by constantly performing istighfar and tawbah. But furthermore, in three places in the Quran, Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen. Yes, it's amazing to be muhsin. It's amazing to be qasid, just. It's beautiful to be of those who are pure. But Allah says, a demonstration is for you to be God conscious. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara. Don't you know that Allah is there watching you? He is fully aware. Hence, this amazing, beautiful story that often our children are inspired by. When an individual came to our third Imam, Sayyid al Shuhada Aba Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And said, Yabna Rasulillah, my problem in this life is that I sin and I can't stop sinning. So, can you give me a prescription so I can stop sinning? Imam says, five scenarios. One of them, if you can achieve, you can sin as much as you like. I remember mentioning this in one community. Many people took their phones and pieces of paper in order to write down. Maybe I can achieve one of them so that I can sin as much as I like. This is an ijaza the third imam is giving us, perhaps. So the first imam, alayhi salam, says what? Go and find somewhere where Allah does not see you and sin as much as you like. I can't do that. Eat from that in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created. And sin as much as you like. No, everything is Allah's creation. Yes. Go somewhere where you do not feel the shame and embarrassment before Allah. That he is not in control of. He doesn't have sovereignty over. I can't. He has sovereignty over everything. When Malakul Maut comes to you to take your life, say to him, excuse me. Anna, please. Tomorrow. Not ready today. Delay, delay. If you can do, sin as much as you like. When Malik, who's Malik? Angel of Jahannam. If he, sorry, I pointed at you, it doesn't mean you, yeah? When Malik comes and says what? Comes and says, I take you to Jahannam. Say, excuse me, I think you got the wrong person. Not me. If you can detract or say to Malik, no, 
then sin as much as you like. If you can't achieve any of these five, how dare you have the audacity before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deliberately. Similarly, the Quran says, that is amazing to have taqwa. What else does Allah love? A specific quality in human beings that Allah really wants to see in us. Inna Allah yuhibbul sabirin. Yes, so this is what the fifth of the qualities. Number six that we need to seek in our lives he often reminds us, you make mistakes, it's okay. Pick yourself up. Karbala teaches you. Hur is a role model. Pick yourself up. Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin. Allah loves those who turn towards him, yes. We have a beautiful hadith of Qudsi in which one of the prophets is told by Allah. What does he say? He says, Anthiril muttaqeen wa abshiril muthnibeen. Warn the God conscious and give glad tidings to the sinners. Ajeeb. It's usually the other way around. Yes? So the uh, Prophet says, Ya Allah, what does this mean? He says, Warn the muttaqi not to be arrogant or think that they are already in Jannah. Protect themselves. Give good tidings to the sinners. Because if they turn towards me in Tawbah, I forgive their sins. I am there for them. Yes? Those who've turned their backs from me, if they knew how much I love them, they would have died because of this realization. Yes? Number six, in Allah, yes, Yuhibbul Mutawakkilin. Allah loves those whom are relying and depending on Him. So we have what? We have Muhsin, we have Muqsit, we have Mutahar. We have muttaqi, we have sabir, we have tawab, and we have mutawakkileen. That's number seven. Those who rely on him, they entrust their affairs in him. The eighth category of people are whom? Inna Allah yuhibbu alladheena yuqatiloona fi sabeelah. Ka'annahum buryanun, bunyanun, marsus. Allah loves those who struggle together collectively. Stand in unity with each other in the battlefield, which could mean the physical battlefield could mean jihad on nafs as well. Dua al-iftitah is a dua of love. It's a dua between the lover and the most beloved. Yes? And here, our holy 12th Imam, Sahib al-Asr wa-Zaman al-Mahdi al-Muntadhar, Ajjal Allah Ta'ala Farajah al-Sharif. wants us to work wants us to work on ourselves in order to appreciate the beauty of God's love and to feel God's love hence there is an important question at the outset which requires your attention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he rewards you and I as a demonstration of his love is this reward a favor from Allah or something we're entitled is it something we should be getting or it's a favor from Allah? It's a very interesting theological discussion between our ulama. Yes? Majority of the fuqa ulama, they say it's not an entitlement. It's a favor. When Allah says, I reward you for good deeds. That is a ni'mah, fadl from Allah. Not something that we ought to be getting. Why? Number one, there isn't a contract between us and God. If we do good, he gives back. There's no contract. When did we sign this contract? Between us and Rabbul Alameen, yes? There is no necessity that ne anything necessitates that I say to Allah, Ya Allah, because I worshipped you, you should reward me. Sometimes people deal with Allah as a business partner. Ya Allah, remember last year I went ziyara, so please. Last year I went to Hajj, Ya Rabbul Alameen. So why are you not uh, helping me now? Ajeeb, so you went to Hajj, now you want something in return. I can imagine Allah saying, you went to Hajj for your benefit, not for my benefit. That is good you went, yes? But this expectation, we deal with Allah, if you give me, I will do. If you do this, I will, yes? I remember one of the mu'minat, may Allah bless her, she came to me once in one of the western countries. She said, you know, I don't wear hijab and I don't pray. But if you give me excuse, I don't wear hijab, I will start praying. 
business. What kind of discussion is this? Oh, but Molana, if you say it's okay, don't wear hijab, I promise me I pray. It doesn't work like this. It's not like if I do this, you should do this. If I do that, we deal with Allah through this lens, which is not the right way. There's no contract between us and Allah. It's a favor of Allah, number one. Number two, how can a slave have a contract or some kind of entitlement when it comes to the master? How can? One time, a man wanted to buy a slave from the marketplace. Back in the time, they used to sell slaves in the marketplace. So he found a slave. He said, I want to buy this person. They said, okay. He looked at the slave and said, what's your name? He said, whatever you want. He said, okay. Took him home, said, what would you like to eat? He said, whatever you want. He said, what would you like to wear? He said, whatever you want. Where would you like to live? He said, whatever you say, I will, I will sleep. He said, don't you want anything? He said, how dare a slave demand anything from the master? We, ya ayyuhal nas, antumul fuqara'u ilallah. Wallahu huwa al al hamid. Yes, we are in need. Allah is not in need. Yes, therefore, in dua al iftitah, our holy 12th Imam continues and says what? He says, الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وأريتني من قدرتك وعرفتني من إجابتك فصرت أدعوك آمنا. Now, Imam Ali Salam is saying here what? He's saying that as a result of all this realization of your love, I am now demonstrating and seeing your omnipotence. I am seeing, I am in awe of your power and your strength. And you have taught me that you do definitely respond to me. Then he says, as therefore, I am now in a position to say this. I can now confidently say to you, Ya Allah, the following four things. What are they? فَصِرْتُ أَدْعُوكَ آمِنًا I am now persisting in calling you, but calling you how? Because when you have that realization of the love of God, those specifically targets, imagine if you say in your life today in the month of Ramadan, I want these eight groups. I want to be at least in some of these groups. Yes? I remember back in the school when we were young, you know, maybe the youngsters here still go through it. When there is two captains to choose a football team, right? And they stand, and then they start picking you with me. The other one says, yes? We all want to be picked first. And the last one to be picked is always like, you know, why no one wants to pick me? Yes? You know what I'm talking about, right? Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there is these eight categories. I want you to be here. I want you to come. Yes? I want to develop myself and nurture myself and scrutinize myself to be amongst those eight categories. There are the guarantees of salvation in this world and akhirah. Hence, Imam says, once I understand this, I come to you in this confident state, which is فَصَرْتُ أَدْعُوكَ آمِنًا Also, not only confident, وَأَسْأَلُكَ مُسْتَأْنِسًا Allahu Akbar He says, now when I ask you, I ask you because I love to ask you. There is uns. Uns is not love. Uns is love with enjoyment. You feel pleasure. How many times when we speak to Allah, we feel pleasure? How many times do we feel that sense of tranquility and calm in our lives? Then he says, La khaifan wa la wajila. No, 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 no. I'm not going to come to you with my heart in a state which is terrible. I am coming to you with a heart that is not only submissive, but also recognizing that there is no need to be afraid or trembling, not because of the punishment of Allah, which I should be, because of my own sins I should be afraid. But I know you, Ya Allah, your power and majesty, your mercy is so abundant, you have invited me, so I come to you in this beautiful way. You know, sometimes I play soccer back in London with some mu'mineen. So I don't play like this, you know. I wear my soccer, football clothes. and Sometimes some of the youngsters come to me and say, Oh, when we see you, Mimbar, you look scary. Molana, you know, this. But now you are wearing your Liverpool shirt, alhamdulillah. Yes. You wear it, and now what? And now you look like one of, one of us. Now I feel like you're not a monster, subhanallah. Why? There are people who think, Oh, you remember this, we cannot touch. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you come to me, have awe, yes, but speak to me with that love, you'll feel it. 
it's nice yes it's an experience mudillan alayka fi ma qasadtu fihi ilayk because the quran says ala anna awliya allah la khawfun alayhim wala hum yahzanun quran says the true friends of allah don't have fear about the future and sadness about the past yes that is the beauty of being Ahlullah, the people with the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the next section of Dua al-Iftitah, it is so important that you and I live through these words of the Holy Twelfth Imam because it's guaranteed in our lives we will come to a junction where we will question this. It is key in our lives for our personal development, for our growth, and it asks and begs the question about my relationship with Allah. The most important relationship I should be working on. I ask you, one of the ulama said this, and it's truly frightening. It is truly a matter of worry for us. He says, you want to know what your relationship with Allah is? Examine your state of heart before salah are you approaching salah with interest or ah i have to do my namaz <laughs> bismillah quick 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 what's the world record 10 seconds i can beat it your heart when it comes to salah do you want to speak to allah or not if we have this heaviness in our hearts in approaching prayers it could indicate a problem when it comes to our relationship with Rabbil Alameen. Because I ask you, what is salah? Something beloved to Allah. It's a conversation with Allah. Do you agree? So why would we have dislike or displeasure from it? Why? Out of 24 hours, how long does it take collectively to pray five prayers? How many minutes? Mashallah. 30 minutes is a great, good thing. It's a balanced salah. Yes. I would say some would say 10 minutes. Out of 24 hours, Allah is saying, okay, between 15 to 30 minutes, let's say 30 minutes, a good, not rushed prayers, average. 30 minutes out of 24, I want you to speak to me. Khalas. I want you to clear your minds, but it's not for my benefit, for you. And I will protect you. Inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. It protects from evil and indecency. It's the first thing that you will be questioned on on the day of Qiyamah. If it's accepted, it's all your deeds are accepted. If it's rejected, everything else is rejected. It's mi'rajul mu'min. It's something that ascends you to the heavens whilst you're there. It has two features, the physical and the spiritual. The moment we pray, the spiritual dimension of salah will be presented to Allah. If it is done hastily without focus, without effort or wrong fiqh, then it goes to Allah in a black, dark, torn clothes, and then it's slapped onto the face of the doer, and the salah says, ضيعتني, ضيعك Allah. You lost me, the opportunity, may Allah lose you. But if it's done in the focus and as much effort, it goes naqiyah, safiya, pure and white, and comes to Allah, and it says to the doer, you protect me, Allah protect you. That is the story, isn't it? Yes. Now, Imam Ali Salam here says, what is my relationship with Allah? One of the aspects that determine my relationship is the following. What does he say? He says, فَإِنْ أَبْطَأَ عَنِّي عَتَبْتُ بِوَجْهِ عَلَيْكِ بِجَهْلِ عَلَيْكِ وَلَعَلَّ الَّذِي أَبْطَأَ عَنِّي هُوَ خَيْرٌ لِي لِعِلْمِكَ بِعَاقِبَةِ الْأُمُورِ Now, What's the Imam talking about here? He's talking about the human struggle, the despair, the despondency, the anger when we don't see or get what we want. When we despair, when we ask Allah continuously and we don't see what we have requested. Fa'in abta anni means what? It means whenever the answer is delayed. The answer to my dua. Ataptu bi jahli alayk. What I do is, sometimes what human beings, some of them do, they blame Allah out of their ignorance. You know, I've spoken to some people, you know what they say? They say, what's the point? When we believe Allah has predestined everything, so my rizq, does Allah know how much he should give me? Of course he does. So why am I asking then? Allah has predetermined that, for example, me, Muhammad, I get this much rizq. 
Why is it then I have to keep asking, Ya Allah, give me, give me, give me. He's going to give it to me anyway. This is where people, their understanding of these concepts, unfortunately, is incomplete or flawed. What do we mean? There is a concept in Shi'i theology. Please understand this because it's part of your aqidah. Aqidah, you can't call a maulana 50-50, ask the audience. Aqidah has to be inside, yes? Fully aware. What is this? al bida What's bida? Oh, al bida These are both used. What is this? This is the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the human being the potential to reach a certain level. Let's say, for example, age. Allah says the maximum, for example, Muhammad can reach in his life is 70 years. But that is if he, number one, asks me for a long life. Number two, does salatul rahim. Number three, the salatul layl. If, if. And I know that if he does or not, because I know it from beginning before creation. There's nothing, Allah says, there's nothing that I'm limited. But then I'm giving him a free choice. If he doesn't do these things, then he will go down to the minimum, which is 40. So there is now between 40 and 70. I have the potential to reach the maximum that Allah has determined for me. Only if I do certain things, this is the belief in Bida, which is a pure school of Ahl al-Bayt Aqeedah. They say you think that Allah is changing his mind. No, it's not about Allah changing. He knows it's given to us as an option, as an opportunity to be able to reach the maximum potential that we can in our lives when it comes to rizq when it comes to lifespan, when it comes to many opportunities that you and I are being given. Why? Because this existence is one based on cause and effect. Asbab, yes? Everything is through means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, in this particular example, I, it's not about what? Predetermined something, yes? It's the knowledge of Allah is there. But because some things happen as a result of our actions, which Allah already knows, then it can extend up to the maximum that he has destined. And that is what the Imam is saying, yes? But then he says, But the same Lord that has delayed this dua definitely is best for me because he has knowledge of what is better for me. Now, let me ask you this question. Musa, ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa alayhi afdalu salati wa salam, was with what? With whom? Was with Khidr, salamullahi alayhi, yes? Khidr, this journey mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf, beautiful story. Most of us are aware without going into it. The second part of the story, when he and Khidr and Yusha ibn Noon, Yusha ibn Noon, was the representative, was the vicegerent of Allah after Musa. Harun was during the life of Musa, but Harun died whilst Musa was still alive. Then it was Yusha. Now, Yusha, Khidr and Musa go into an area in a city, they see children playing. What does Khidr do? He's a prophet, he's ma'asum, he's still alive, he's with the 12th Imam. He is mentioned in the Quran as a righteous servant of Allah, given knowledge which is ladunni, special ilm. Yes? Now, he takes this 14-year-old boy playing with the children somewhere and kills him. A prophet kills an innocent human being. And isn't this an opportunity for atheists and agnostics to come and say, where is your God's mercy? How can you explain this? How can this make sense? Explain it. May Allah bless the souls of those four innocent young boys who died exactly 10 years ago here. Yesterday was their 10 year anniversary. Yes. When that, unfortunately, the building collapsed and you all know. Yes. I remember... Mu'mineen at that time were wondering, what's this? How can these young children, you know, die in this state? And of course, the others, those who passed away as well, 
from the mu'mineen, mu'minat, from the other Muslims. May Allah bless their souls. I think maybe around 30 or something. Or I don't know. I can't remember this number. Whatever number it is, these people, especially the children people, find difficulty accepting. This story of an atheist or an agnostic of a non-Muslim comes to you and says, explain to me how on earth does a prophet kill an innocent boy and he hasn't committed a single sin? This doesn't point to God's injustice, ma'ad Allah. Imam Ali salam is giving us a lesson, dua al-iftitah. What is this lesson? This lesson is found in the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. You may dislike something and it's good for you. Wa asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum. You may like something and it's bad for you. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah knows and you do not know. Someone says, okay, but okay, of course, I know Allah is the all-knowing. But how can I explain this? It doesn't sit well with me that a young boy who hasn't committed anything, he didn't have a chance to get married. Go to university. I was saying some groups, he didn't get a chance to get married. Someone looked at me and says, Alhamdulillah, he's blessed. So he didn't get that opportunity in life to go through these pleasures that human beings go through. Why? Someone says, why is Allah punishing him this way? It doesn't sit well with me. Now, let's come to the Quran. There are answers. What do we find? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he was going to grow older. He was going to oppress people, going to take the wealth from his family, especially his parents, out of mercy for his parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his life away. Someone says, but wait, he hasn't yet done it. Yes? Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Mawla al-Muttaqeen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi was one time, what? He was approached by the Laeen Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam. Ibn Muljam came to him and said, Ya Ali, Allah has witnessed how much I love you. Amir al-Mu'mineen looks at him and says, Bima ma'na, what meant was, that is not true. The man said, but I do. He said, no. People looked and said, Ya Ali, when he went, why are you saying he doesn't love you? He says, because this man will kill me, will strike me. They said, ah. So finish him before he finishes you. He says, how can I crack this injustice and act before the act has taken place? I know I have the ilm, but I can't act on it. Imams would never do so. Now here, you might say, yeah, see, he's going to be oppressor. So why? He hasn't yet done it. So it's, how can this be punishment? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? This child, instead of going to Jahannam, I'm taking him to Jannah. Instead of being punished, he's going to be rewarded. I ask you, someone comes to you and I and says, instead of living 70 years where Allah knows where we're going to be, Jannah, Jahannam, question, so many, you will die at the age of 14, you go straight to paradise. Which one would you choose? If you choose the 70, see me afterwards, there are problems. Yes? Every single one of us would say, 14, who cares? I go Jannah all my life. The rest, there's no rest. Eternity. Now, is this punishment or mercy? It's mercy. Ah, so now I'm looking at it from another perspective. It's a good thing. Really? Was it a good thing? Allah, out of his love and mercy for that boy, said, I'm going to take you to Jannah. Yes? But for many people seeing this act from outside without reflecting, without pondering, without contemplation, will go into a conclusion which drives them away from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah wa ta'ala here demonstrates his benevolence, demonstrates his mercy and generosity and magnanimity. You might ask the question, okay, then why did he allow people like Saddam and Yazid and Hajjaj, alayhim la'ainullah, these wretched individuals, why did he allow them to live then? Could have taken their lives. Allah chooses out of his hikmah, he's wise. He allows certain people to live and certain people he ends their life. But there is a lesson here. Someone says, oh, but why did the prophet have to kill him? Khidr, we believe, is a prophet. Many mufassirin or many ulama, mutakallimin, Shia and Sunni believe that he's a prophet. Yes. Anyway, why did he have to kill him? Why couldn't he just die naturally? Because if he had died naturally, he wouldn't be in the story and we wouldn't learn from it. There has to be something for us to learn and say, ah, 
Hold back. What's going on? There has to be something to draw our attention. Dies naturally. Many kids die naturally. But there is a lesson Allah wants to teach us in the Quran here. And that is when you see something you don't understand, don't always jump into conclusion and accuse Allah and say, oh, Allah is doing this to me. And no, hold back. Hold yourself. No, Allah is Halim. No, Allah is Hakim. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Alim. He knows what is best you and I. Therefore, the best quality, one of the most magnificent qualities of an individual who recognizes this, who upon this over the Quran, upon this over hadith, is taslim. I submit to Allah. I trust him. I love him. I know he's doing this for a good cause, for a good reason. That's the power of taslim. Taslim means what? Taslim doesn't mean that something you are convinced you submit. It means something you're not convinced you submit. It means something that you find difficulty accepting at the first level. فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ Who? Ibrahim and Ismail, they both submitted, yes? They said, okay, no problem. Yes? It's hard to accept Ibrahim waiting a hundred years for a son. Now Allah says, I want you to store to him. Does this make sense? Makes sense? In a generation today of youngsters and others that say, I will only do what makes sense. is a powerful lesson in the Quran. Allah says, You've got to trust me. Not everything makes sense to you and I, yes? And therefore, this particular realization is key in dua al iftitah because insan is ajul, insan is hasty, wants to know always what is, what if, this and the other. And Allah says, take a deep breath, take a step back, look at things from a different lens and you realize everything works for a reason, everything has fallen into place. Now, when this realization hits, when we begin to understand this, we come to the conclusion that what? When I am reciting dua, am I trying to convince Allah to change his mind? You know, some people say, I really have to beg because I need to make... Because sometimes when we ask others, we beg. Yes? We beg, please, 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 in the hope that that person changes their mind if we want something. I ask you this question. When I'm asking Allah, am I hoping that he changes his mind about something? Think about it. Because if I believe this, this is wrong. Change of mind is a human feature, not Allah. For Allah to go through a change, yes, is not one of the divine qualities. Why? Because, because... He then means he's not a permanent being. He goes from one state to another. We are, and we ask Allah in dua, we're not asking to change his mind. What are we asking for then? We're asking for ourselves to have a bigger capacity to receive what he's going to give us. Not always are we ready to receive what he's going to give us. Does that make sense? You and I each have a vessel, our hearts, our Ability to take what we can take. In Jannah, the narration says, there are people who will see others higher than them. And they ask Allah, Ya Allah, why are these people on a higher level in Jannah? The response will be, they were more patient than you. Then they will ask, Ya Allah, but why didn't you test us more so that we're also patient like them? Allah will say to them, I know your limit. If I tested you more, I would have lost you. That's your limit. They were able to be more patient because their limit was higher. Yes? They were able to exercise steadfastness and forbearance much more and much better than you. Now, the Imam alayhi salam, having realized this, now he goes towards this beautiful line. Oh my goodness. This particular line in Dua al iftitah is the ishq, the demonstration of a person who's truly loving Allah. If you can memorize this part, huh? this part of Dua al iftitah if you reflect on it, it's a story of humility and tawadha and nothingness before Allah, but it's truly the language of a lover. Yes? فَلَمْ أَرَ مَوْلًا كَرِيمًا أَصْبَرَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدٍ لَئِيمٍ مِنْكَ عَلَيَّ يَا رَبْ إنك تدعوني فأولي عنك وتتحبب إلي فأتبغض إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أقبل منك كأن لي التطول عليك فلم يمنعك ذلك 
This line, Allahu Akbar. Having reached, Imam is building, 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 building us. I was this particular progression of the heart, of the state of mind. Now we've reached a particular point in this particular discussion, right? Which is what? I am expressing love. I am anticipating. I am aware. I have cognizance. I have reflected on the divine attributes of Allah. Now I know where I am. Now let me make a stance. Now make me a statement. I need to say this. I have never seen فَلَمْ أَرَ مَوْلًا كَرِيمًا أَصْبَرَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدٍ لَئِيمٍ مِنْكَ عَلَيَّ يَا رَبْ I want to say, Ya Allah, I have never even witnessed or thought of seeing a master who is so generous deal with a slave who is so miserly. Why? إِنَّكَ تَدْعُونِي فَأُوَلِّي عَنْكِ Ya Allah, how many times you've called me? Say, come. I want you to come. I want you to find the path. But I run away. You ask me when, how? When did Allah call us? Yes. We get so many messages on a daily basis. I don't mean text messages or WhatsApp. We get many signs from Allah. Many signs throughout our lives. This now you are sitting here. Hopefully listening to things are a sign. That gets you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes a lost one, a loved one passes away. That's a sign. Sometimes you lose wealth. That's a sign. Sometimes you gain wealth. That's a sign. Sometimes you're ill and you become better. That's a sign. Sometimes you're walking and you see something, it draws your attention. Ah, that's a sign. Sometimes someone says something and it's a sign. One of the ulama says, once I finished majlis, and what happened? Someone came to me and said, Molana, I have a question. He says, what? He said, finished. I'm finished. I'm a goner. I'm leaving this world. He said, oh. He said, yes, but I would like to ask you, if I ask Tawbah now, will Allah accept? He said, Allah, Arham Rahimin, Tawabun Rahim. Of course you can ask. And don't worry. Have strength in Allah, belief, He will cure you because He's merciful, the alim said. The man looks at him and says, if He doesn't cure me, He's not merciful. The alim said, put my head down and said, this man must have some knowledge. And I asked him, what's your story? What's happened to you? He said, you know, when I knew this realization, I locked myself in the house. I didn't want to see anyone. I didn't want to meet anyone. Then I thought, you know what? Why am I doing this? So I went out with a smile, helped a person cross the road, helped a poor person, assisted an individual, all this, because I realized that there's no point. What am I wasting my life for? Yes? The alim said, may Allah bless you. That's a really great thing. He said, thank you very much. He stood up to leave. The alim said, come back, come back. He said, why? I said, how long have you got to live? You didn't tell me. He said, I went to the doctor. I said to him, can you guarantee me that I'll live for the next five years? He said, no. For the next two years? He said, no. He said, for the next one year? He said, no. He said, can you guarantee me any time? He said, no. I said, then it hit me. I may go any minute. Thank you, Mawlana. Khuda Hafiz. Sometimes when you hear a story like this, or when you speak to someone like this, it's a sign from Allah that none of us knows when they will leave. None of us know when they will depart from this existence, isn't it? Yes? And that's why, you know, I remember, I can't remember Marhum's name, but when I was here Ramadan last, I think 2015, 2016, doing the majalis in the first 15 nights, there was one of the Marhumin, he was in his 60s here in this blessed Jamaat. He was in his office 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Allah, he was fasting, he was very, he was in his office working 4 p.m., 10 p.m. after Majlis, we buried him in the Qabristan. Some of you may remember, 2015, 2016. I remember, I led the namaz, a mayyid. He was fine. 4 p.m. in his office fasting. 10 p.m. he was six feet under. Do we guarantee? Can we? These realizations hit us hard. And that's why the Imam Ali Salam want to bring us into this particular relationship. I am Laim, you are Kareem. And that realization is truly powerful. Hence, one of those groups of people who have mastered the ishq and love of Allah is awliya Allah chosen by him subhanahu wa ta'ala who serve him not because they are forced to or there is an obligation but because they have seen and are witnessing and feeling his grandeur, his mercy and his excellence. What does Amir al-Mu'mineen say? Yes, Ilahi. 
ولا طمعا في جنتك ولكنني رأيتك أهلا للعبادة فعبدتك يا الله it's not because of the punishment in hell and it's not because of the Jannah reward that I worship you. I see you worthy of worship and therefore I worship you. This ishq of Ahl al-Bayt towards Allah. If you read Dua Abu Hamza, do you know what the Imam says, the fourth holy Imam? He says, Ya Allah, do you know what? I'll just say to you this, that I love you so much that if you put me in Jahannam, I will turn to the people of Jahannam and describe to them how much I love you. That's my role going to be in Jahannam. I testify. And Imam means it, huh? Sometimes we say it out of... Uh, hopefully I will not be put in Jahannam. <laughs> no, no, Imam, absolutely. Yes, if I'm there, I, I will speak to people about your beauty. Yes, and that's why these Ahl al-Bayt, they'll have conversations about the love of Allah. You will read that com beautiful conversation between these great individuals who demonstrated love of Allah in words and actions. Amir al muminin and his beloved daughter, Sayyida Zainab. When they are having these conversations, what happens? Amir al-Mu'mineen asks his young daughter and says, do you love Allah? She says, yes. He says to her, do you love me? He says, yes. He says, How can you love me and love Allah? And she says, oh father, I love you because I love Allah. That heart of Zainab was so powerful in the love of the Almighty, that heart of Zainab enabled her to see what she saw on the 10th of Muharram and yet remain steadfast. The ziyara says, لَقَدْ عَجَبَتْ بِصَبْرِكَ مَلَائِكَةُ السَّمَاءِ Ya Aba Abdullah, the angels of the heavens are in awe about your patience. But Sayyid al-Shuhada's patience was sublime, was brilliant. But on the 10th of Muharram, he met his Lord. But there was one person who saw what Hussein saw, but even continued to see tragedies after Aba Abdullah. What heart did Zainab have? That indeed, today we say patience, sabr, learnt what it means from Zainab. The quality of sabr looks at Aqila to Bani Hashim. That connection between Amir al muminin and Sayyidah Zainab based on the love of Allah was so powerful that we're told on those moments in the early hours of the 19th of Ramadan when Amir al muminin was being carried held by Imam al Hassan and Hussein his head dripping with blood his face pale as the poison of the sword spreads around his body, he is taking these steps towards the house. Some of the mu'mineen have seen the house in Masjid al-Kufa. There are a few meters you walk outside Masjid al-Kufa. The riwayah says, he looked at Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein said, now I don't want you to hold me. Now I want to walk. They said, Father, why? He said, I don't want Zainab to see me in this state. I don't want Zainab's heart to be broken in this way. Yes. How much love did Amir al muminin have for Zainab and did not want her heart to be broken? Did not want her heart to be upset? We say to him, Ya Ali, come to Karbala and see what Zainab had to see. If only you saw what Zainab had to endure, yes, you did not want her to see you being carried. But Zainab saw Azgar with an arrow down his throat. Zainab saw the mutilated bodies of whom? Of her sons, Aun and Muhammad. Zainab saw Akbar's head split into two. That is why the riwayah says that night, Sham Gariba, when Sayyidah Zainab fell asleep, the riwayah says she saw whom? She saw her father. Yes, but how did she see her father? The riwayah says she felt like there was a child missing from the plains of Karbala. She went out on the plains of Karbala looking left and right for this orphan of Imam al Hussein. When she saw this child with a man who is on his horse holding this child of Imam al Hussein, she walked slowly. The riwayah says, Wallah, it breaks the heart. The riwayah says she 
looked at that man. She couldn't notice who she, he was. He had his face covered. She said to him, oh man, I ask you, they have slapped us tonight, yes? They have hit us tonight, please, yes? This is a yatim of Imam al Hussein. If you look after them, I will pray for you on the day of Qiyamah that you get the shafa'ah of my father Ali, Allah. You get the shafa'ah of my father Ali. Just treat this yatim, yes, with respect. The man comes down from the horse very carefully, places the young child on the ground, looks at Zainab, removes his face covering, says, my daughter, I am your father Ali, yes. I am your father. Tell me, the poet then describes, he says, tell me, O Zainab, tell me, what did you see on the day of Ashura? This is now the conversation between the father and the daughter. Now he wants to know what happened on the day of Ashura in Karbala. Zainab says, father, which musibah shall I start with? So I ask her, she's Ummul Masaib, carrying all those tragedies. Then she looks at her father and says, father, they say the body of Ashura Abbas is next to Furat without arms that the arrow pierced through his eyes father I did not have a chance to bid farewell to my protector Abbas father that's a musiba that breaks my heart oh father father if only you saw how they chased us from one tent to another this covering of mine was burnt that Yishimer poked me with his his stick and with his spears. Father, they snatched the outer hijab from us. We are your daughters. We are daughters of Rasulullah. Father, they did all this. But Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, yes, there is one musiba, Zainab says, one musiba that Zainab will never ever forget in her life. Father, I saw Shimir walking towards Aba Abdullah. Father, Father, I saw Shimmer kick the body of Abba Abdullah. Father, I saw Shimmer stab the body of Abba Abdullah. Ya Ali, I saw the head of Hussein on a spear. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين. We pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى to grant us the توفيق to be able to go on the journey of His love and we pray to Him سبحانه وتعالى to make us of those who attain His love through the most loving people to Allah, the Holy Prophet and His. Ahl al -bayt. We pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the souls of those mu'mineen who passed away 10 years ago in this tragic accident. And we dedicate and present the thawab of Suratul Mubarakatul Fatiha to their souls and to all your marhumeen al-Fatiha.